there is an instant attraction between the tall, likable Trenton and the young, pregnant Amber. They went to dinner and they never spent a night apart after that. When secrets start to pile up, things can turn deadly. Especially when someone is about to lose everything and has easy access to a gun. The definition of a sociopath is someone who lacks a conscience or the ability to empathize with others. A murderer that shakes the very foundations of small town America and leaves everyone asking why. People think of Michigan. Detroit, Motor City, and the birthplace of Motown are two things that might come to mind. Very few instantly think of northern Michigan with its wild and untamed beauty, covered in forest and locked between three of the Great Lakes, Superior, Michigan, and Huron. Levering is a small rural community in Emmett County. If you blink, you'll pass it on the way to the Mackinac Bridge to get to the UP, the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. Very desolate, in the middle of nowhere. Trenton Mallory is born and raised in Levering. He's known as Trading Trent because he's always doing internet deals and trading up for something better. He likes to buy and resell guns on different marketplace sites. When I first met Trenton, I thought he was this big, goofy, six and a half foot tall man. He was just amazing. I knew he was a person that I wanted to be friends with. His personality just reached out and grabbed you. I worked for a big box store and he used to come in and he was a distributor. Amber grows up in Charlotte, Michigan, about three hours south of Levering. When Amber was little, she always had the need to make people laugh and she just found a way to do it so naturally. She was hysterical. Amber was sweet as, sweet as pie, she really was. She always smiled, she's a beautiful person inside and out. Because of her excellent grades, Amber receives a scholarship to go to college. She doesn't stay happy there for long, coming home at Thanksgiving, already deciding never to go back. Disappointed and exasperated with Amber's behavior, Darlene feels once again it is another argument that ends with Amber getting her own way. Amber got into the party life and Amber got into having fun while they expected her to get good grades. She had a scholarship. She just didn't want to do it. She was with a boyfriend she had met and she got pregnant. So it just didn't work out. And there she was, home, pregnant, by herself. With her boyfriend no longer in the picture, pregnant and living in her mom's basement. Darlene is unsure of Amber's future, but she has an idea. Amber and Trenton should meet. They had so many common interests. I mean, they both liked the same sports teams. They were both into the outdoors, real people oriented. They went to dinner and they never spent a night apart after that. They move in together immediately. They kind of reminded you of a little old married couple. They just bicker, 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 and then it was just a big joke, and their relationship was so full of love and energy. When I saw them together, it just made my heart beam because it was like Amber had finally found what she was really looking for. Trouble soon strikes the happy couple. At three months old, their son is rushed by a helicopter downstate to the children's hospital with an enlarged heart. He is diagnosed with cardiomyopathy. And it was so severe, he had to be on a transplant list and he had a Berlin heart. It was actually a heart on the outside of his body that pumped the blood through him. The medical care for this child was putting them in, in a financial ruin. Medications upward of $5,000 a week are vital to their son staying alive and not covered by insurance. To make matters even worse, their son develops leukemia generated by the cardiomyopathy and medication. Four weeks before her son is to get his heart transplant, Amber and Trenton find out she is pregnant. 
The heart transplant took a real toll on them. I mean, they were both exhausted. At one point, Amber just was like, I can't deal with a relationship and this. And Trenton was like, no, we're a family. You don't walk away from family. We will work on this. Amber needs a break from the stress of the overwhelming medical bills and looking after her constantly sick child. She decides to head to the casino one night and blow off some steam. To her surprise, she wins $1,200. Date night was the casino. Amber got Trenton going, and then they both just really liked it. They would go to the casino at least once a week. Things finally seem on the upswing for the devoted couple. The oldest boy has had his heart transplant, as in remission from his leukemia, and their youngest son is born healthy. It just made my heart beam because it was like Amber had finally found what she was really looking for. Amber didn't just, you know, slide over the bar. She wanted to be the best. She wanted to be the best mom at school. She wanted to be the best partner to her husband. She wanted to be the best, you know, everything. The morning of March 6th, 2014, starts off bright, cold, and crystal clear at minus 21 degrees Fahrenheit. It's also a busy morning for Amber. Her first stop is to buy snacks for school at the local store. Amber had left the residence that morning to take her kids to school. She left about 7.05 a.m. When she left, Trent was sleeping in bed. Normally, they took the bus. This morning, she decided to drive him to school. She went to a small store in Pelston, where she purchased a snack for her son to take to, to class that day. Next stop is to take her younger son, who has been sick for a few days, to the local clinic. And while she's sitting there waiting for her son to be evaluated by the doctor, she texts Trent at about 9.13 a.m. with no response from him. After they leave quick care, they go to pick up a prescription for the son. Amber makes her last purchase at 9.46 a.m. before heading off to her sister Amy's house for a quick visit. Amy lives with her partner Mike, about 20 minutes away from Levering, but no one is at their place. So they head home, arriving at around 10.30. Little does Amber and her son know what is waiting for them at their home. March 6, 2014, starts off bright, cold, and crystal clear. It's also a busy morning for Amber. Little does Amber and her son know what is waiting for them at their home. The initial call was March 6, 2014 from Amber Smith. She indicated that when she returned home that morning, the door was ajar to the residence. And she walks inside and she sees the house in disarray. It wasn't like how she left it. There's pill bottles all over the place. The drawers are pulled out. So she just gets inside the house and sees this. Uh, she stated that she did not see Trent, backed out and went to the car and called 911. The Emma County Sheriff's Department deputy responded to the scene, made contact with her. Okay, so the inside door is open. Which I just thought was weird, you know. But, but I mean, Trent is the most forgetful person that I know, so I was like, yeah, hey, we just forgot to shut the door. Maybe you didn't get up. And, you, and I'm sorry, so you're out, are you outside when you call 911? I told Carson to get his dudes on, back on and get back outside, right. which he did. And I told him to get in his car seat just because I knew it was safe inside the car. I dialed 911 and then I sat in the car with him. There was some medications that were in the kitchen cupboard that were thrown down onto the counter as though somebody was going through the medications. There was a small sentry beige style safe that was open laid on the floor. You know, the contents of the medicine cabinet and the cabinet where the sink was at had been thrown askew onto the floor. They had a number of guns. 
Upon entering the bedroom, the deputy could see that there was a subject laying in bed. He had the covers, uh, blankets up to his neck. There was obviously visible sign of trauma to the subject's head, and he was deceased in bed. There's no doubt in the deputy's mind that he has found Trenton Mallory. A detective soon arrives on the scene and starts speaking to Amber, hoping to get a clearer picture as to what has happened. As hard as it is to question someone minutes after they've learned their loved one has been murdered, it's imperative to find out as much as possible and as quickly as possible about the victim. There is absolutely nothing easy to say to do to make you feel any better at this point. That's why I'm terribly sorry for this. That's what I'm here for. I'm going to figure this out. Um, I got to ask you a lot of questions. So as you may know or may not, time is of the essence in the situation. I guess okay. The reporting person always needs to be cleared. Spouse, a fiance, a girlfriend, anybody that's close to the deceased, you're going to want to clear them with an alibi or at least verify their story the best you can and get a better picture of what's going on. At the beginning, the world is wide open as far as potential suspects goes. Trenton is Mr. Nice Guy. He is a hard-working family man. There is nobody that can be found who would say anything negative about Trent or who can give a reason as to why someone would want to kill him. Who doesn't like Trent? Who would be his biggest enemies? Everybody likes Trent. He is such a good guy. Everybody likes him. Enemies? Um, I don't think so. Trenton is the most amazing man ever. I couldn't love him more if I had given birth to him. Trenton was so special and so kind. He would do anything for anybody. If this, in fact, is a homicide, <laughs> if it is, I would assume that you would cooperate to the fullest. Uh, and that means taking computers, phones, anything. That's fine. I don't care. With the cooperation of a grief-stricken Amber secured, police start tracking movements, calls, and texts between her and Trenton and others involved in their lives. Inside of the bedroom where Trent was located deceased, there was a gun cabinet. In there was approximately five long guns. Underneath the bed in a case was another long gun. And then there was another long gun that was propped up against the closet door in the bedroom, along with ammunition and other hunting supplies. Trenton's body is removed by the medical examiner. The autopsy shows that Trenton has died from a single gunshot wound to the left side of his head, an inch or two behind his ear. The projectile used to shoot Trent was a 22 Super X long rifle bullet. The spent projectile removed from, from Trent's head at that time by the autopsy appeared to be 22 caliber, which would be consistent with the empty casing found next to the bed. Medical examiner placed the time of death on March 6, 2014 at 9 a.m. And based on the alibi that was presented by Amber Smith at that time, she was not at home at 9 a.m. as the time of death that was indicated on Trent's death certificate. Police officers came and knocked on my door and asked me if I knew Trent Mallory, and I said yes, and they told me that he had passed away. And I was like, you know, where, where did the accident happen? And they're like, he was murdered. Amber Smith comes home to discover their house has been broken into and ransacked. Even more horrible, her fiancé Trenton is found murdered in the master bedroom, lying face down on the bed with severe head trauma. I have to tell you that we are treating this as a homicide, okay? <laughs> 
It was very plausible that this was a, a break-in and Trent just did not wake up and, you know, somebody actually shot him while attempting to steal stuff from his house. This point, what's going to happen at this point is basically a bunch of investigators are going to be at your house for a period of time, okay? All right? Um, now, when you... Um, when he pulled up to the driveway, you saw the inside doors open. The screen was shut, but it's always, it's always a little, little jar. Right. When you walked into the house, did you yell for Trent at all? No, because I didn't know if he was still sleeping or not. So. Okay. The world was wide open as far as to potential suspects and who would want to kill Trent would want to break into their house, who would know that Amber and, and the kids had left at the time they did. So it was a matter of digging into to Trent's life, into Amber's life, into the family's life, to, just to see, is there something that we don't know about? Is there there's something going on? Detectives begin coming up with various scenarios and suspects and slowly start to eliminate those with an alibi. How did the person get in the house? Was there forced entry? Did they break into the house? I mean, how was, how did they gain entry to the house to commit this crime? They're way out in the middle of nowhere. There's so many people that he's always dealing with from work and people swing by and he tells me who they are, but if you understood Trent, <laughs> there are so many people that he knows and that know him and, you know, they'll stop by or will swing by someone else's house. So. Trenton was buying items like from sporting goods stores, trail cams and, you know, different kind of weaponry, you know, hunting rifles and hunting gear. And he was buying them and then selling them on Facebook Marketplace. They kind of started looking at that aspect of trading Trent was his nickname, that maybe he just got in with the wrong person. So we're in the, basically in the middle of nowhere, right? Yeah. Basically in the middle of nowhere. And why, if I were to tell you that it's a possibility, okay, uh, that somebody caused the death here, that somebody caused the death to Trenton, who do you think would do such a thing? Nobody. <laughs> Trent buys and trades a lot of stuff, so there's always people coming and going, buying stuff or selling stuff. People involved in the trading and bartering world are not always what or who they seem to be. Many people post items for sale with descriptions that are not always accurate. The old saying, buyer beware, still rings true especially when buying, selling, and trading guns and ammunition. Occasionally, stories of deals gone wrong will reach police. Her husband says that Trent had told him that he was dealing with a person down in Big Rapids with guns. That guy was so mad. Trent was mad too because he drove out there and it wasn't even, it wasn't just for a gun. He, she had a tractor for sale, like a garden tractor. Good. And they were selling it really cheap. And then I was like, okay, well, if it, you know, runs fine, then we'll definitely buy it. Um, and he got there and said that he didn't want to buy the tractor because, you know, it wasn't in the shape that he thought it was in. He just started yelling at him, swearing at him. And, and Trent, at Trent? Yeah. And Trent was like, well, I'll still buy the rifle or the shotgun from you, but. Um, you know, I don't want the tractor, and they just went off on it. Okay. You and know the names of these people? I have no idea. I know they blocked us on Facebook, so we can't even see them. People are selling guns. You know, they use guns to trade and barter in, in rural areas. None of those guns were taken. They were just left there. I mean, if anything, you can get money from guns, but they were left behind. They had TVs, they had trail camps, they had hunting equipment, they had a lot of guns, all things that would be particularly desirable for somebody who had a nefarious intent, okay? They had some money. They did have some cash on hand that there'd been a big fundraiser in the area, and they'd gotten some cash. And they had drugs, okay? Not, not street drugs, they, were, they weren't like that, okay? But they had drugs that were 
marketable, maybe. Guns, money, and drugs, that's, that's what drives the world, right? That's a red flag. Why would somebody break and shoot somebody and not take anything? Well, it's telling me uh, somebody wanted so somebody dead. If the motive is not to steal anything, what other reasons would someone have to want Trenton dead? Is there a reason why anybody would want to take Trent out of the picture? And we really struggled to find too many people that really fit that bill. We did learn of uh, that Amber did have an affair within the last few months prior to that. After the transplant, she had started contacting a previous boyfriend and started, you know, doing things that just were so out of character. It was like she needed to escape her own life. And it, it didn't turn out very well. How well do you know Ryan Hunter? Ryan Hunter. I used to work with him. How well do you know him? Um, he cheated on his wife with me. Mm -hmm. I don't work there. Okay. And when was the last time you contacted him? I talked to him in 2011. Um, was the last time you talked to him? We talked on Facebook. Maybe it was 2012. I don't know. It was a couple years ago. Right. Well, it's actually it was six to eight months ago. Excuse me? Correct. We have those. Six to eight months ago? That's correct. Law enforcement always has to make sure that anyone having an affair with the partner of someone who is murdered is also not an accomplice or guilty of that murder. In short, to eliminate the affair as a motive for the murder. In northern Michigan, detectives continue to focus on breaking and entering, with Trenton Mallory's hobby of buying and selling guns as a possible motive for his murder. Why would somebody break and shoot somebody and not take anything? Well, it's telling me uh, somebody wanted so somebody dead. One thing that interests detectives is that Amber has yet to ask how Trenton died. Do you know how he died? Nobody. Huh? Nobody. Are you curious? So there's several different ways that a homicide can occur, correct? Do you agree? Yeah. Um. So. So he was shot. Um, but it appears that he was sleeping when this occurred. Hey, look this. Look at this from the detective's point of view. Okay. We're in broad daylight. Yes. A house in the middle of nowhere. There's a truck parked in the driveway. Mm -hmm. okay. um, the door's open. There's neighbors, mm -hmm. right? Um, and then all of a sudden, a person is shot in his sleep. Does mm -hmm. that sound odd to you? We interviewed Amber, and the, the details changed. There was just little things that would change over time because it's hard to keep track of all those inconsistencies, which, you know, made her a uh, prime suspect, but certainly didn't put us over the top where we could charge her at that point. Another thing detectives are soon able to rule out is whether this is a burglary with narcotics being the primary goal. It's been observed that the kitchen cupboards and medicine cabinets have been gone through and prescriptions and pill bottles scattered everywhere. I see a lot of medication in there. Who's, who's that for? There's antibiotics in there. A bunch of dental work done. Marshall takes meds. Um, we buy a lot of over-the-counter cold products and stuff when they're 88 cents at Walmart. Oh, it's just a bunch of random stuff. Her son had a lot of medications, being a transplant person, and they thought maybe if he had narcotics or something, but these medicines were very dangerous for anybody who didn't need them. But they thought maybe it was for the medications, to, because we do have a lot of drug problem here. Like a safe, like a fireproof safe? safe, and that's open. Is, is that usually locked? It, well, it's locked, but the keys sit right on top of it. Like, we're not real safe about it. <laughs> What, what? I mean, if we leave, sometimes we take the keys with us, like, if we go, you know, away for a day or two. Mm -hmm. Or if, like, someone comes over to babysit, we put the keys away, but usually the keys are just sitting there. What could they possibly be looking for in there? I mean, they're opening up the safe, they're going through drawers, the person's going through a lot of different things. I mean, we've got guns in there. So if I was a bad guy and I wanted to walk in there, 
to get something. We keep money in the house. People know that we normally have cash on hand if we need something. Okay. Who are these people that know that? I don't know. I imagine if you said that somebody got into the safe, that they took our money, you know, which, whatever. But I don't know why anybody would hurt Trent, because if they needed the money that bad, he would just give it to them. One of the big challenges detectives face is the discrepancy in statements between family members and friends. Often, people remember things differently for a number of reasons. Some of those reasons are innocent. Others are not. In the case of Amber's statement, things are not adding up the way they should. Sound like you guys had a, it's an amazing relationship. Wow, it was. I mean, you know, I've known Trent for a long time. We went on a blind date 10 years ago, and I chased that boy, chased that boy, and, you know, he just didn't want anything to do with me, and, you know, we were the greatest friends. But then I decided to go off and get engaged to somebody else, and then all of a sudden he was interested in me. It was fine, and then Marshall came along, and, you know, he loves kids. Like, there's nothing in this world that Trent ever wanted more than to be a dad. Like, he just always wanted a house full of kids. We realized that we know each other better than most married couples know each other because we were best friends. And, um, you know, we tried to date, and then the stuff happened with Marshall, and, you know, it was just too much stress for me, like, trying to deal with a dying child when I was pregnant. But then after Carson was born, you know, we figured it out. Investigators are having a hard time reconciling Amber's insistence that this is a burglary gone wrong with the facts of the case. Amber tried to claim that this was a burglary. There were a few things that were disheveled. The victim was killed with a 22 rifle. Despite the fact that she claimed this was a burglary, forced entry into the home, there were numerous other guns in the house that were untouched and the murder weapon was missing. As the investigation unfolds, it turns out that Amber and uh, Trenton had been advertising this particular 22 rifle for sale. She actually had held it up with a serial number on one of the photographs, proudly advertising it for sale. It's the one gun that's missing from their home. At first, she claimed she had no knowledge of that gun. She had never held that gun. And later, looking at her uh, social media, She's got the gun in her hand, and she's advertising it for sale. Even though under Michigan law, prosecutors do not need to prove a motive to get a conviction, investigators still want to know the why of the case. Usually, so does a jury when it involves murder. What we found out in digging into their finances was their house was in foreclosure, one of their vehicles was being repossessed. They were severely behind on other loans as well. They had a mountain of credit card debt. And in addition to all of that, Amber was taking out payday Friday loans continuously at 300% interest just to get money. Why? Because she had a gambling addiction. She spent an exorbitant amount of money on gambling. Most, if not all, of these loans and this debt were taken out by her, and they were in Trenton's name. She tried to take out a loan in his name even after he was murdered. As far as anybody knew, their relationship was still real good. But I saw, as Amber's mom, I knew what was out of characteristic for her. And when I heard her calling creditors saying Trent had changed his phone number and she would give him hers, all of a sudden my mailbox in Charlevoix, which is like 70 miles away, is filling up with their mail. She's just like, I don't want to burden Trenton with all the knowing about all these bills because he's so worried about them. She just got very manipulative. Amber had come to me at one point and told me that, you know, she was really in a financial bind. I took a loan out and I loaned Amber the money. Well, six months later is when all these bills started arriving in my mailbox. And I said, Amber, I, I took a loan out. I. I bailed you out of your financial trouble. What is all this? Well, she had over $25,000 in debt at the casino alone. And plus, they had credit card debt. Um, she had stopped paying the mortgage. The house was in foreclosure. 
The car had been repoed a few times. I mean, in fact, one time when it got repoed, she told Trenton that her and I got into an argument and she threatened to run me over with the car, so the police took her car. And he believed it. I had been watching Amber unravel for months. I mean, she was doing things like alienating the whole family against each other. When Amber gets into a situation, her first instinct is to just totally do away with it. I mean, there was no Amber sitting down talking to Trenton about their finances or anything. She just killed him. As fingers continue to point to Amber, detectives do their best to try and get some answers from her that make sense. I gotta tell you that um, there's a piece of inf information or piece of evidence that we have. Okay. It's in the lab right now. We're there. I can't tell you. I mean, it could, it could be anything from you know, blood, fingerprints, shell casings. It can spend 22 shell. If you have fingerprint, it's spend 22 shell. DNA in a 22 shell. Mm -hmm. Okay. Those type of things. Mm -hmm. All right. And um, uh, we found the spent shell that was used. Okay. There's DNA. All right. Is there any possible way that your DNA can be on that shell? There's a lot of 22 shells discarded at my house. Yeah. I mean, we were shooting the 22. We know that that shell is the shell that was used uh, to strike Trent. Okay. What I'm asking you is a simple question, though. All right. Is that 22 shell the one that we have? Okay. That potentially has a fingerprint and DNA on that shell. Is that going to come back to you? No. You better be absolutely certain, because I'm telling you right now, what you're seeing is not necessarily true. I can't explain it for you. Well, why is that? I Both did not people. shoot Trent, so... Okay. So you asked me if my DNA would be on that spent shell piece, and so okay. I would say no. In northern Michigan, Trenton Mallory has been murdered and his fiance, Amber, is under suspicion. I mean, there was no Amber sitting down talking to Trenton about their finances or anything. She just killed him. The one thing that was missing in the case was the murder weapon. We had a pretty good circumstantial case against her, but without that murder weapon, we didn't have the smoking gun, so to speak. And several months later, when the snow melted at her sister's house, her sister sees this 22 rifle buried in the snow. Did the right thing, call the police. Detectives strike gold when they receive a call from Amy, Amber's sister, telling them she thinks the missing murder weapon is sticking out of a snowbank at her partner Mike's house. Quickly, detectives persuade Amy to allow them to record a conversation with Amber, asking her about the gun. Hello, I'm to talk to you. I went up to Mike's house, and when I was leaving there, I noticed something in the snowbank, and when I talked to him... I, I, no, I put it there yesterday, and I was going to stop at Mike's house today and talk to him. You put the gun in the yard? I just, I just bought it because I wanted something for home protection. Oh. What do you do with it? I didn't touch it. Oh, okay. Are you kidding me? I didn't know. I mean, it looks a lot like the, it looks like a lot like the gun that they had a picture of. They said, oh, because there was a gun missing, and um, I was just shaking. and freaked right out. Uh, if you could um, go like right to Mike and get it because um, yeah. I, I just gotta get out of there. All right, I'll be there with you. Amber makes up this ridiculous story about having bought a gun for protection after Trenton was killed, and she was just basically storing it in the snowbank at her sister's house. When Amber was little, she was as stubborn as they came. I mean, she was headstrong. And Amber, even as a little girl, could never accept defeat. And if Amber failed at something, she took it so hard that she would find ways to cover it up. Dude, I totally misunderstood what you said to me. I was buying a gun from a person named Snow and asked them to meet me at my house. Stop and somebody stuck a gun in your snow bank. I, I just don't get this off. I don't either. I love you, but I mean, did you, you didn't do this, did you? No, I didn't do it. So the sister said, well, come out here and get rid of this thing. 
come pick it up. And of course, the police were there waiting for her. I'm recording. Amber does show up in her vehicle, which is uh, recorded. And you can see she gets out of her car and she's kind of looking around. And she physically starts to use her hands to dig in the snowbank, looking for the rifle, uh, but it's unable to locate it. She's coming back to her car. It was no longer there because the police had removed it. They confronted her about it. And of course, she did what sociopaths do. She lied and denied anything. I talked to her right in the driveway and told her that, uh, you know, we had retrieved a, a gun from the snowbank and that she had just talked to Amy about the gun. So you don't have any idea? Because mm -hmm. it, <clears throat> it appears to, me, to maybe be the same gun that we're looking for. That's what she told me. Well, this is the point right now, Amber, that her story's starting to unravel. OK. okay? We've told enough things that are half-truths, untruths, and just flat-out lies at this point that they're all coming back to bite you. You don't have an explanation this time. You put your weapon inside your sister's shelf I did You didn't. collected the murder weapon that killed your fiance out of your sister's driveway. 
okay? And that, where do you think that is right now? I have no idea. That's at the lab being processed for a lot of different things. She denied knowing anything about the gun being in the snowbank. So no matter what you confronted her with, she just denied. When a gun is recovered, before it comes to the lab for an analysis, it's sent to another lab. It's sent to like a serological lab where they swab the gun for DNA and fingerprints. Now keep in mind, this gun was in a wet environment, was in snow. Your probability becomes lower to try to get any kind of physical evidence. Not impossible, not impossible. You still can, but it's, it's, it's very difficult. I believe in this particular instance, they did remove some fingerprints off of it. They had her prints on file and they compared them to Amber's prints and, and they found out to be a match. In a case like this, you want to have uh, all that forensic evidence processed uh, before you actually make arrests. So in this case, we did we chose not to because we were still waiting. Uh, now that we had the rifle, they could do the test firing of the rifle. And in that process, you know, they're going to compare the firing pin from that rifle to the firing pin from the casing that was retrieved out of the bedroom where Trent was killed, along with the actual spent projectile that was removed from Trent's head with the rifling of the, the rifle itself. Once you have those pieces of the puzzle, it becomes very clear uh, that that rifle retrieved from the snowbank is the same rifle that was posted by Amber and also was the one that killed Trent. In her alibi, in her recitation of the events of that morning, Amber clearly detailed where she had been. And one of the places she said she stopped that morning was her sister's house. So her own statement connected her to where the gun was eventually located after the snow melts the following spring. The ballistic analysis confirmed that the casing located in the bedroom next to Trent's body was matched to the rifle, the 1022 Ruger rifle that was recovered from the snowbank. The projectile removed from Trent's head was also matched to the 1022 Ruger removed from the snowbank. And when the gun was retrieved out of the snowbank, there was actually a live round in the chamber that was ejected, which was consistent with the same ammunition used to kill Trent. Amber committing the crime was all about she couldn't admit that she had really messed up. You know, they were losing their home and everything, and Trent had no idea. She had hid it from him so well. I guess I can't get inside Amber's head for why she killed Trenton. After talking to her numerous times, she is a total narcissist. It's all about Amber. The truth's going to be that you shot your fiance in bed while he was sleeping with a rifle that you put in your sister's driveway. It's going to make you look like this cold-blooded killer that thinks about nothing except yourself. When the gun was found in the snowbank and turned over to the forensic laboratory, the case basically turned into a slam dunk against Amber. At that point, it was frosting on the cake. There was indisputable evidence at that point that Amber was guilty. Even Amber's perfect alibi, which she has so carefully constructed, would not stand up in court. We got a guilty verdict, I would say, within a half hour. Amber Smith was convicted for first-degree murder and felony firearm. Now, that conviction is an automatic life sentence without parole. She is getting sent to prison forever, and it's never going to be out in her lifetime. I'm 100% sure she's guilty. I felt like I lost a son and a daughter. Everybody said he was the nicest guy in the world. He was the best father, not only for his own son, but her son as well. Never in my wildest dreams did I think she was capable of taking a life, especially someone like Trenton who gave her the world.
West Coast, now I'm in the East Coast. Shawty wanna